Hello YouTubers out there, this is Jerry at the Movies. As some of you know, I often interview people in show business, and a few months back I did interview a former Hollywood stunt woman and stunt coordinator, Leslie Hoffman. Now, uh, long story short, uh, let's just say that our conversation, which initially was going to be about her work as a stunt woman, and how difficult it was to be a stunt woman in uh, Hollywood had changed focus completely and it's really more about being blacklisted in Hollywood in particular by SAG now women almost never get treated fairly in the workforce and that's a known federal government fact stunt women get treated even worse while the federal government, the producers, and the Screen Actors Guild turn a blind eye towards this situation. Case in point would be someone who was treated, probably uh, no one treated uh, clearly as much with as much malignance as stunt woman Leslie Hoffman, who has been blacklisted by SAG through its past members of the board of directors, including certain stuntmen, some who, as stunt coordinators, hire the stunt people. Now, I've known Leslie Hoffman on the silver screen, as I'm sure many horror fans do, from her brief cameo in A Nightmare on Elm Street, the 1984 classic by director Wes Craven. Now, in that, she played a high school guard who was actually Freddy Krueger. She taunts Nancy, played by Heather Lang Langenkamp, in a dream sequence with the words, Hey Nancy, no running in the hallway. Now, actually, Leslie Hoffman has also had a long run in the movie business as a stunt woman and stunt coordinator, performing stunts on TV series such as Dark... Uh, Star Trek Deep Space Nine and Star Trek Voyager, MASH, Emergency, Love Boat, Remington Steel, and many other film credits, including everything from 1976's uh, Two Minute Warning, which was her first union job that allowed her to join SAG, to The Naked Dun Gun, where she did a stunt doubling for Queen Elizabeth. Now, as a result, when Leslie became the first stunt woman to be elected to the Hollywood Board of Directors of SAG, which was from 1981 to 1985, as well as the first stunt woman elected to the AFTRA local board and AFTRA national board. Now, it was with the AFTRA national board where she and board member Howard Kane convinced them to create the category of stunt person. Now, these titles, unfortunately, came with more handicaps and perks. From the first day that Leslie was elected to the SAG Board of Directors position, she was vilified, lied to, and made to seem as if she couldn't handle the job single-handedly. Now, this was mainly due to her gender, thus she became blacklisted. And as she stipulated, due to the stuntman who was finishing out his term, as Leslie said, spreads, spreading vicious rumors about me, it seriously compromised my ability to work with the Board of Directors because many of those rumors tainted me. Ed Asner demanded that a stuntman was brought into the SAG board as the stunt groups requested of him at a meeting Asner set up at a restaurant slash bar in Burbank to compliment me and to help me do my job, which is normally handled by one stuntman in the past, which is what Leslie basically dictated to me uh, in our interview. Now, Edward Asner, by the way, uh, uh, an actor and liberal activist, best known for playing Lou Grant, was president of SAG from 1981 to 1985 and did little to help Leslie at all. In fact, and I'm quoting here, his siding with the stuntmen's groups conveniently stopping me from being an advocate, Leslie, that is, that could help stunt women, stunt people of color, and the independent Caucasian stunt men from getting jobs as well. Amazing to believe that anyone that was not in a stuntman's group was fair game for the stunt groups to demand SAG to bring an independent up on charges, said Leslie, and sadly, she could not be protected, or rather, she could not protect the young performers and actors, as she would like to have kept them safe. And, and quote, now, Leslie often did her job perhaps too well, or maybe a woman doing this job is not what SAG had in mind. What is troubling is that she was elected by the SAG membership and the nominating committee had chosen her as well. What did the nominating committee have in mind when they nominated her? Because the fact is that Leslie looked after and spoke out on stunts performed by everyone, not just stunt groups, but also independent stunt people, as well as actors. For example, she, shortly after the Twilight Zone, the movie Tragedy, that resulted in the deaths of two non-union children working past certain designated hours 
in fact, working past 10 p.m. to be precise, and the death of actor Vic Morrow. Leslie was sent to Sacramento to represent SAG at a hearing that California wanted to change the child labor laws. Now, the California state attorney wanted a new Twilight Zone law passed that would say children cannot be near any rotors. And Leslie pointed out that it should be specific to helicopters, since rotors exist in cars, hair dryers, etc. And considering Leslie was the chairwoman of the National Stunt and Safety Committee and the co-chair of the Young Performers Committee, her expertise in this area of stunts should not have come as a surprise. Yet when it came to contract negotiations, the executive board went outside the norm by not originally sending the SAG director to New York. So instead of sending her, they sent a Caucasian stuntman. Now, the truth is that a certain SAG-promoted stunt group did not want Leslie speaking out on anything but stunts. I say certain because, uh, due to an ongoing litigation, I cannot name certain names, and this is per Leslie's request. Now, since Leslie could not be a member of the male-only group, it was easier to remove her, so rumors spread that Leslie voted against everything this certain stunt group wanted. If Leslie likes the things that have been going for her with work, she should keep on being Asner's little girl. Maybe she's not planning on being a stunt woman anymore. Maybe she's going to be an actress, and then Ed can get her jobs. Which was dictated from a letter written to Ed Asner by then SAG board member Barry Howard. Now, two stuntmen assaulted Leslie with these words while this SAG board member was standing next to Leslie at 20th Century Fox. Now, obviously, Asner was made aware of this verbal assault towards Leslie, by reading this letter written by this board member. But unfortunately, once again, Asner sided with the stuntmen since he did what the stunt groups wanted. Which was odd, because Ed Asner, being a liberal activist and uh, looking after the rights of uh, people who, uh, let's say, have been wronged uh, in any situation, and that goes for all uh, types of people, really, um, you think he would have helped out Leslie, uh, but that was not to be. Now, this discrimination continued on to the end of Leslie Hoffman's career by certain stunt coordinators who never hired her again. This was not due, though, to her lack of professionalism or knowledge in the area of stunts. Her crime was that she was a woman in a male-dominated field. Even when she went to the SAG attorneys claiming discrimination, they sent her a letter saying there was nothing they could do. Which is odd, once again, and I have to point this out because, uh, you know, uh, this will be a future show topic for sure. Um, Hollywood is known to be very liberal. And this is something you hear time and again. They're so liberal, and they make liberal movies for liberals, and this sort of thing. And truth is, Hollywood, by and large, and I've seen enough Hollywood movies to tell you, um, this are conservative uh, more than liberal, uh, depending on who you're talking about, because even certain filmmakers who are extreme leftists will occasionally, you know, teeter to the conservative base just a little bit. But for a place that makes supposedly liberal movies, their policies that they have in, uh, or that they hold dear to, if with regards to actors, directors, and writers, and so on, uh, well, they certainly don't manifest as liberal. They manifest uh, not even as conservative, just as greedy, perhaps. And that goes through, uh, that's, goes for SAG as well. Now, moving right along, the, this kind of discrimination towards Leslie Hoffman shouldn't come as a shock to some, although it made to some readers. And especially, as I said, in an organization like SAG, the largest, uh, one of the largest labor unions in the country. Now, Consider these facts. SAG contracts for actors often eclipse actresses by more than half. For example, in 1997, SAG contracts for actresses exceeded by $472 million, whereas for actors it exceeded $928 million. Now, this would mean discrimination is alive and well, and the producers and the SAG headquarters do little to stop it. An interesting fact is that since the EEOC, the Equal Opportunity uh, pardon me, Equal Employment Opportunity Commission of 1964 stipulated that any company that received funds from the federal government is supposed to investigate any discriminatory acts and correct them. 
Therefore, the producers are violating federal government rules. Also, the producers and SAG since at least 1977 have the following so-called affirmative action clause in their contract that stipulates when applicable and with due regards to safety, women can double for women and minorities can double for minorities. Now, this is clearly a statement that a Caucasian stunt coordinator must qualify women and people of color, but nowhere will one find in the codified 2005 contract, the last producer signed contract, that a Caucasian stuntman must be qualified. So a man can double for a woman by putting on a wig and paint himself black. This also makes it difficult for a stunt woman uh, or a stunt person of color to advance to the position of stunt coordinator. So the EEOC violations, uh, they, they, this is what SAG and the producers ignore. Now the blacklisting continues and the focus changes a little bit, but the blacklisting still remains the same, just a little more complicated. Uh, this comes in regards to her health. As you can imagine, being a stunt woman and performing stunts results in mild brain injuries or concussions. So after 35 years of performing stunts on big screen and on television, Leslie Hoffman suffered aches in her neck and her back and also mild brain injuries or concussions, primarily from all the falls and fights that she had performed. At first, she filed a workman's comp claim based on continuous trauma and then for Social Security. However, the straw that broke the camel's back came in 2003, when Leslie had the symptoms of post-concussion syndrome, an issue which many of you will find topical, particularly in regards to athletes in the NFL. And this includes, uh, this syndrome includes lack of sleep, aches, depression, and leads quite often to a nervous breakdown. Now, Leslie Hoffman was awarded a settlement in the workman's comp case because an agreed upon medical examiner found that 95% of her injuries were on the scent and thus work related. The federal government, SSDI, considered her permanently disabled, but the judge failed to mention that the original claim, her original claim, was based on the physical injury she had received as a stunt woman. So this ruling, though correct in some aspects, would come back to haunt her later. Now receiving, receiving a SSDI, SAG gave Leslie her SAG pension, which she was entitled to for various years of being vested as a stunt woman. Yet SAG denied her the disability health plan. Now this is very important. This is a hidden clause and the producer SAG health pamphlet that stipulates that SAG members who suffer a career-ending injury while working on the set are entitled to health benefits. SAG denied her health benefits and she was forced to file a lawsuit against the plan under the ERISA Act, the Employee Retirement Security Act. Now she's been grossly overpaying on a health plan, RX plan, and dental insurance from different companies while waiting for the result of the ERISA lawsuit. Some of you will find this rather familiar uh, in slightly different regard. Now, this is an ongoing litigation due to the SAG attorneys purposefully stretching the suit out. Now, this is not an uncommon ploy for SAG. They've done it to several staff members who were wrongfully fired due to discrimination. Now, according to Leslie, in July of 2010, an appeal board of no less than 75 people, some were in attendance via satellite uplink, were present to discuss Leslie's health plan and if she should receive it. She says it was more like an inquisition of the 18, mind you, 18 Los Angeles SAG trustees. They were either former SAG board members or SAG paid staff. Now, five of those SAG trustees shared a past with Leslie. Four were ex-executive SAG board members, one being the vice president for two of the four years that Leslie served, and another member was an alternate to the executive board who had worked as a regular cast member on the Lou Grant show, which of course starred at Asner. So there's a little linkage right there. Now, the fifth member was a stuntman from the 1980s whom the executive board sent to New York first instead of the stunt board member, if you recall I mentioned on the last show, and there was a medical expert hired by the producer, SAG Health Plan. Now, when asked by the medical ex expert about the paper she had brought in on post-concussion syndrome, Leslie had stated that she had certain symptoms from PCS, that, but that she was not a qualified doctor. 
So the doctor's response to her in the room about post-concussion syndrome was a declarative no, followed by a vile laugh. Now keep in mind this doctor never examined Leslie in the first place. It should also be noted that the doctor's previous employer or employment was with Blue Cross as a vice president. The plan SAG has bought for years. Now, the stuntman, who's clearly not a practitioner of medicine, let out this doozy of a precondition to Leslie, stating, Knowing that you have congenital scoliosis, maybe you should never have been a stunt woman. Now, Leslie did not have congenital scoliosis and had recent MRIs and a bone scan to prove it, since corporations and pharmaceutical companies overrun the healthcare system. This is no surprise whatsoever. So, in fact, the SAG producer health plan is currently being investigated by the Department of Labor. Suffice to say, Leslie Hoffman has been blacklisted by SAG. That's it. That's all there is to say. Her last job was as a SAG stunt coordinator for a Star Trek fan film entitled Starship Farragut. Though she did it for free, it still falls under the Screen Actors Guild new media contract. And though she is a veteran stunt woman and an advocate for all, her own price to pay for her art is being female in an actively, though not exclusively, male profession, populated by several stunt women who never get enough of the credit they deserve. Leslie has tried to tell her story to the NWACP, NOW, and ACLU, not to mention various magazines, radio shows, and newspapers, and all of them show no interest whatsoever. Well, except for me and a couple of other people. Now, Leslie has recently fought for two other stuntmen and a stunt woman who were entitled to the SAG Disability Health Plan. Again, this is a hidden clause. She was able to get the stunt woman back money she was wrongfully charged as a reimbursement, and disability health plans for the stunt, uh, two stunt women, uh, men rather, who otherwise might not have received the plan. So they were all reimbursed. The irony is that the stunt people whom she has helped receive their health plan or reimbursement were not even required to go to the appeal board, whereas Leslie had to. So this is retaliation for her advocacy of more than 30 years. She is the resilient fighter for justice for all stunt people, and Leslie Hoffman is a voice that needs to be heard. So discrimination, loss of health care plans, disability, being a woman in, again, not exclusively a man's profession, there should be no deaf ears in her hallway, please story like this needs to be spread like wildfire. And I would hope it would be, but I guess we'll never, uh, who knows what's going to happen. I do have hope for Leslie Hoffman, and uh, I do consider her a friend. And uh, this has been a very detailed uh, two-part show, and I know some of you might not fully understand it, some of you may understand it all too well. Um, but I, I do believe that SAG largest labor union needs to help its own people and it does but only certain people not everyone who's involved in the arts whether it's an actor director etc uh, primarily actors stunt people deserve the benefits they get particularly stunts and uh, it's a very dangerous profession i don't think even leslie would tell you otherwise it's a very very dangerous profession we've heard about many accidents and deaths as a result of stunts. Um, so let's hope Leslie Hoffman gets the help that she deserves. It's uh, difficult to say if this story will gain more momentum or lose it. I would hope it does um, for her own benefit and to understand what kind of a place SAG is. And uh, Hollywood, Hollywood, as we know, has had its own share of uh, Babylonish extremes in the past. Uh, not always being kind to its own uh, talent. But let's hope that uh, can change its course a little bit. Probably needs the right kind of SAG president to take care uh, of things. Ken Howard is the current president there now. So uh, I have uh, hope for Leslie Hoffman. Let's, let's hope. And that's the end of this show. Leslie Hoffman. Former Hollywood stunt woman, blacklisted by SAG. And this is Jerry the Movies, signing off.